the death of Osama bin Laden and the Arab awakening and the revolutions that it's caused throughout the Middle East have produced both positive events and negative events. We tend to focus on the negative, but we shouldn't lose sight of the positive. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, a look at the Middle East, the good news and the bad news. The Arab awakening and the death of Osama bin Laden marked the beginning of a long and arduous path to change for many countries in the Middle East and North Africa. While Egypt has held its first free elections, Syrian leadership wages a brutal and bloody crackdown on its people. Senior fellow Bruce Rydell takes stock of the region, saying there's both good news and bad. The Afghan war is the longest war in American history. It's been frustrating. We made many, many mistakes along the way. But we have now found an exit strategy that allows us to bring our troops home responsibly while leaving behind an Afghanistan that can cope with the Taliban insurgency with its own army, with our help, but without our troops. We have achieved an exit strategy that not only allows us to get out of there, leaving behind something that will protect our interests, but through the new strategic agreement we have with Afghanistan, we will be able to continue to use Afghan military bases for counter-terror missions, like the SEAL raid that killed bin Laden, for the next 10 years. Bin Laden's death has certainly made this a lot easier in Afghanistan because it's demonstrated to the American people and to people in South Asia that the United States could find high-value target number one and take him out. For 10 years, the myth existed that Osama bin Laden was somewhere hiding where America could never find him. That myth was destroyed on the night of May 1st, 2011, and it has made possible an easier American withdrawal from Afghanistan and at the same time, an easier American long-term strategic relationship with Afghanistan. Those two events, the death of Osama bin Laden and the Arab Spring, they must have had an impact on Pakistan and the U.S. and that relationship. Certainly the death of bin Laden has had a tremendous impact on the American relationship with Pakistan. Finding bin Laden there has raised the fundamental question, who in Pakistan was helping him? Was it just other parts of the global jihad, or was it the Pakistani intelligence service? We don't know the answer to that question, but that question hangs like a dark cloud over U.S.-Pakistan relations and will remain there until we come to some kind of closure about it. Well, Bruce, all eyes are on Egypt with its new constitution, with its uh, first democratic election in 5,000 years. Is there anything that can derail this monumental step forward? The Egyptian effort could get derailed. Political differences between the parties in Egypt are serious and real. Many Egyptians don't trust the Islamic parties. The Islamic parties are divided among themselves. And then there's always the specter of the relationship with Israel next door. Most Egyptians don't like the peace treaty with Israel. They don't want to go to war with Israel, but they find the peace treaty to be very humiliating. Any kind of shock in the Israeli-Palestinian world, another intifada, another war in Lebanon, will produce enormous strain on the Israeli-Egyptian relationship like we have never seen since Sadat went to Jerusalem. Well, let's look at Syria. The revolution there, you say, has gone disastrously sour. The Bashar Assad government has refused any kind of reform and has responded to peaceful demonstrations with overwhelming brute force. This should come as no surprise to anyone who's wallowed the Assad governments. Bashar's father, Hafez al-Assad, killed 30,000 people in the city of Hama in 1982. I know, I was there, I saw it. It was an unbelievable demonstration of brute military force. The Assad government today refuses to give anything to the revolutionaries. And what's happening is a revolution that started as a peaceful uprising has now become radicalized and has broken down on sectarian grounds and is likely to become more and more violent, more and more extreme, and it's also likely to spill over. And then there's Bahrain. And that democratic movement 
is the one you say everyone's forgotten, and it's since been co-opted by Saudi Arabia. There are almost daily demonstrations, some of them quite violent in Bahrain these days. Bahrain was occupied by Saudi Arabia a year ago. The Saudis are now talking about some kind of political union between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. That's not a good idea. The Saudis need to let Bahrain try to find its own political solutions to withdraw their forces from Bahrain and let a political process move forward. Bahrain has a severe sectarian problem. The majority of the people are Shia, the ruling monarchy are Sunni. The Shia-Sunni divide immediately raises the Arab-Persian divide and the Saudi-Iranian divide. The best way to get away from all these complications in the problem is to get back to the root of the problem, which is trying to find a way for greater participation for the majority of Bahrainis in their own political process. And then the whole Arab Awakening, Arab Spring movement is not really over. You say there are two other countries ripe for revolution. Saudi Arabia and Algeria. Saudi Arabia is no more immune to revolution than Egypt or any other country in the Middle East. It has a large young population which is underemployed and unemployed and unsatisfied with having no voice in the politics of their country. And the other is Algeria. Algeria is the largest country in the Arab world in terms of size. It's the largest country in Africa in terms of size. It's one of the biggest natural gas exporters in the world. And Algeria has all the problems of its neighbors. A huge unemployment problem, a huge youth bulge, and a police state in which accountability is non-existent. In Algeria, we don't even know who really runs the country. Algerians talk about le pouvoir, the power, the generals behind the scenes who make all the decisions. Algeria is a country that's ripe for revolution except for one thing. It's had two scarring experiences in the last 25 years with Islamic upheavals that have killed thousands of people. And Algerians have a fresh nightmare of what violent change can look like. But nightmares don't last forever. And sooner or later, Algerians are also going to want to have political process in their country and if le pouvoir stands in the way forever, sooner or later, Algeria will have a revolution too. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.